This is learning session three for this afternoon. Improving the preparedness for public health systems prevent and respond to shocks. And who better than the master of public health sciences for this country and the most distinguished person that we have in terms of the public health sciences for this country, Professor Padmabhushan, honorary uh, distinguished professor, public health sciences, public health foundation of India, Professor K. Srinath Reddy. Professor Srinath Reddy is a cardiologist and the founder, past president of the Public Health Foundation of India. And I really have to make it brief because otherwise I would be reading a bio of at least four to five pages to begin with. Formerly, he headed the Department of Cardiology for the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. The president's cardiologist for many years. Under his able guidanceship, guidance and leadership, PHFI established five institutes of public health, IIPHS, to advance multidisciplinary public health education, research, health technologies, and implementation support for strengthening health systems. He presently serves as an adjunct prof professor for epidemiology at the Harvard School from 2014 to 23, holds several advisory positions, is on almost every panel where, he, where you need to either moderate or find his expertise to give awards, including at the PMAC. He has over 570 scientific publications and a book, Make Health in India Reaching a Billion Plus. Awarded the Padma Bhushan by the President of India in 2005, one of the highest civilian awards that we can think of. Professor Reddy actually needs no introduction to this crowd. Thank you, Dr. Professor Reddy, for being here. He's now currently setting up and taking public health to the next level. It's called the Institute of Public Health Sciences, and it will have all the other cross-functional learnings that come into public health under his leadership and guidance. And that will be in our proud city of Hyderabad. Thank you, Dr. Professor Reddy. Lois, can I have you back here on the da dais, please? And I'm not going to read what Eloise has done again because she is somebody who just shared the dais with us. I next have Dr. Hassan, Habib Hassan Farooqi. He's an additional professor for Public Health Foundation of India. Professor Farooqi is, has his major in economics and he worked as a postdoctoral fellow in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 2013 and 14, and a surveillance medical officer at the WHO in 2007 and 8. His research and teaching interests include evidence-based medicine, the intersection of infectious disease epidemiology and economics, and health economics with a focus on pharmaceutical economics and the HTA. He has served as a member and technical expertise on several national and international advisory committees, published more than 50 peer-reviewed journal articles, and serves as a reviewer and editor in the top Indian journals. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Hadi. Next, have a friend and a privileged um, partner in crime with several breakfasts that we have and we discuss a lot on One Health. I have Dr. Vijay L. Dandi. He is the head of infectious disease and public health at Share India. Dr. Vijay is very illustrious and focuses on disorders of the immune system and inflammatory diseases. 
For over three decades, he has been managing patients with autoimmune disorders who have undergone transplantation as well as with, paper, with HIV AIDS infections related to travel. He has rich experience in the appropriate use of state-of-the-art technology that can empower people to take control of their own health. A clinician, an educator, he is both certified in infectious diseases, ABIM. He's a clinical professor of medicine and surgery at the University of Illinois at Chicago, for which he travels regularly to be a part of the teaching faculty too. He's the faculty at the Public Health Foundation of India, has received numerous awards in the US of A for teaching public health work and leadership in healthcare. And what a privilege. We also have um, Dr. Fuji Shu, who's joining us remote. She was wanting to be here with us uh, in Hyderabad. Unfortunately, a last minute visa denial was what kept her uh, in China. Dr. Fuji Shu works with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and wears several hats amongst others. Dr. Panda, who's here with us, he's a distinguished scientist of the Indian Council of the Med Medical Research and the former additional director general ICMR, ex-head ECD ICMR. I will hand it over to you and I please excuse my faux pas and not having been able to. I'm sure Dr. Panda will forgive you because uh, the last drops of tea are the sweetest and therefore to be introduced at the very end is a privilege. Thank you. Uh, the session I have been asked to assist in as a moderator is on improving the preparedness of public health systems to preempt, prevent and respond to shocks. One of the key lessons that COVID-19 has taught us and which I believe has resonated in the earlier sessions is that unless we have an efficient, equitable and empathetic health system performing reliably in the steady state we will not be able to create a swift, strong, and sustained surge response when a public health emergency does arise. And how do we actually ensure that we build those systems which can both respond to the shocks and at the same time continue to perform all the functions that are routinely expected of that system in very many other areas and therefore it is that part that we must try and advance as we move along. As a moderator my task is fairly simple. It is essentially to assist the erudite and eloquent panelists to share their wisdom with us. And therefore, I'll keep my introductory remarks very brief. But when public health comes up, and particularly in the context of health systems with which it is juxtapositioned often in discussion, we probably need to define the span of public health, what its remit is. Many people have defined public health in different contexts but with different functions. It can be very narrow or very broad. For me, public health requires us to, or enables us to, identify and influence the very many determinants of health at the population level to impact upon health at the individual level. And it does, through, does that through policies, through systems, through programs, and through community engagement. Therefore, we have a very broad span to consider, even in this panel. But we have to recognize that we are also dealing 
with a system that is not only complex but frequently changing in terms of its challenges, in terms of health transition which is proceeding at different speeds and through different processes in different parts of the world and even within the same country in different regions, we find there is a different level of health transition that has happened, throwing up a different mix of challenges, but nevertheless the system has to adapt as rapidly as possible and respond as efficiently as possible. And we also recognize that resources are finite and we have to get the maximum advantage of whatever resources we have even as we make the case for uh, enhancement in the resources that are allocated, particularly public financing, which has to really be the foundational basis for strong public health systems. But then we also have to consider what the other stakeholders also bring in, the private sector, the academia, the community, all of that. We, all these have been referred to in the earlier session as well. But how do we actually draw upon their strengths and resources in order to build that kind of a unified response that advances public health? And we also have to recognize that science and technology is providing us a number of new tools, whether they are digital technologies or molecular technologies, and there is a whole strength of science that needs to be harvested in order to infuse greater strength into our public health response as we move along. And this requires also that people who are actually being trained as public health professionals acquire the requisite competencies to deal with and respond to this complexity with alacrity and efficiency. Are we able to create those kind of public health professionals? And should we only satisfy ourselves by creating public health professionals as teachers and researchers? What about public health practitioners and those who are actually also enabling much greater level of efficiency in delivery of public health programs at the field level? So what are the training requirements there? And how do we actually build teams that will function efficiently rather than just training individuals? How do we bring in complexity science into the whole area? And of course, there was a discussion about mixed methods, quantitative and qualitative aspects of research as well as even in terms of uh, the competencies that are required in that, those areas during public health education. So while public health has much to deliver, there is also that much we need to do in order to enable public health systems uh, to perform better and particularly through the kind of uh, training and educational programs that we deliver. So some of these issues are going to be definitely uh, addressed by the panelists and in order to really bring forth some of the elements, uh, we have had a few structured questions to lead off, but then we can also, based upon the responses, uh, try and take up other questions, uh, which I'm sure will arise from their stimulating comments. Uh, firstly, Dr. Panda. Uh, Basically, you have seen public health in India in very many capacities. But you have also recognized that public health professionals are not available with the requisite numbers and skills that this complex health system of India demands. There have been attempts over the past two decades to try and create more public health professionals to supplement those that are being produced in the medical colleges. Now, given the complexity that we have sort of described, what are the kind of competencies that we need to bring in in a standardized manner in the, into the training programs, whether they are of public health professionals in classical degree courses or public health uh, practitioners and training programs, how do we actually bring in greater degree of competencies 
uh, across the country uh, with the numbers and skills that are required. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Reddy, uh, for that very important question. And is it required standardization and development of the competencies in order to, in order to address the challenges that we face? And the whole discussion is situated um, within the context of resilience, health system resilience. So the answer, in short, is a resounding yes. Do we need more trained human resource who'd have uh, competency to deal with the challenges of the shock, in that sense. But then if we try unpack this, I think that we need to go a little deeper uh, by looking into what kind of competencies. And there, uh, what we are trying to do post-COVID, particularly in order to analyze what went wrong and how we could fix them so that in future we deal with them better. So that's like identifying what went wrong and then we have protocols and standardized procedures and people get trained on that. But I think it is also important in, in training those professionals to see what is going okay, what is going right in terms of regular activities. And when we use the term shock, it prompted me while I was listening to, uh, and if we take the analogy from earthquake, Sometimes in Richter scale, you get a severe earthquake, but it's not that all the earthquakes are very severe. There are, you know, minor shocks as well, and that happens in the public health system. And do we record them, and what do we do in order to handle them? So there is an experiential learning or adaptive learning. While things are going wrong at the public health, health system and within the public health system, at the, at, the, at the local level, at the peripheral level, there are adjustments which are happening. The goal adjustment and, and, and the methods which are adopted in order to absorb those shocks. So I think that the, the, the training of the public health professionals need not to remain only in that classical form of analyzing an event, what went wrong and what could be protocolized and standardized but also what went right in terms of the minor shocks getting absorbed at the local level innovations. That's one. The, why I'm saying this is because uh, what is to be done vis-a-vis -vis what gets actually done has a whole lot of learnings uh, getting generated at the local level, at the, at, the, at the tribal, within the tribal communities or even at the territorial level. So there was a, a reference to our earlier sessions, where do we start? And public health, uh, historically, need to start at the most vulnerable sites and for the vulnerable population. So if the lessons are being generated there, that needs to be incorporated, not only in the training curriculum, but also who teaches. They should teach. So it is not the, uh, because Professor Reddy used term like a professional curriculum and the degree courses. And there we can think of other trained public health professionals teaching others. But I think the teaching should come from those who have evolved those uh, lessons in terms of who have generated those lessons while there were minor shocks and the minor shocks were very successfully addressed. The last uh, point that I would uh, try uh, you know, indicate, uh, we did have a uh, you know, demonstration of, of the tool 76 uh, indicators in order to figure out uh, can we really understand a public health system as you know resilient or not and all those had numerators and the denominators so it's a quantitative uh, way of looking into it but the the stories that you get to listen to the, the the lessons that you capture the case studies successful examples of handling with the shocks they usually come in a very rich narrative text and in the form of qualitative indicator so it's so very important to have that incorporated within the system of teaching and training public health professionals. And lastly, they, 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 they should not be institutionalized, centralized. So that you, you started with the problem that the challenges are so many and uh, dispersed in dispersed geographical locations. So uh, there has to be an opportunity for the trainees to learn also from different social technical and economical uh, context. So contextualized learning is what is required.
So they are necessary for generic learning as well. I'm not belittling that. But that will probably help us to understand how could we handle things better that, could be, that, it, that we are able to predict. But there are many unpredictable elements as well. So we, the best way of dealing, or our, our, our ability to remain prepared for dealing with unpredictable elements would be to, to have the teaching and the learning uh, there at the community, where the vulnerable population or the geographical terrain remains, and uh, uh, getting them paired up with the training session. I'll stop there. Thank you. You have uh, stimulated me enough to uh, follow up with a question for you before I move on to the other panelists. So you've said experiential learning, contextualized learning, and definitely much more adaptive in terms of knowledge acquisition and application. <laughs> now, given the multiple determinants of health, how much should public health education become more multidisciplinary than it is now to enable multi-sectoral application? Because public health education has been interpreted in different contexts, even in India, to be relatively limited, available only to medically trained professionals, occasionally extended to social scientists, but is it not a much bigger, broader church that we need if we really want to make public health a successful mission? Of course. Again, another resounding yes. Uh, it's not just a biomedical approach, or if you, if you allow me to use the term, we, we are familiar with these terms, particularly in medical parlance, pharmaceutical intervention and non-pharmaceutical intervention. So drawing it a further and expanding that understanding uh, would clearly tell us that uh, the resilience in the health system and our ability to deal with whatever may come, not necessarily always it will come in a nice package of predictable shock. There will be many unpredictable shocks and that does require uh, going beyond the biomedical model and of course it requires the multi-sectoral involvement and not only even sectors but also the community groups where the wisdom lies. I'll, just if you allow me one second, I mean, or maybe five seconds. Since morning we have been talking about translating the knowledge into action and people are referring to what Dr. Krishna already said. It reminded me, sitting in this room, it reminded me in the, in the, in the preface of Harman Hiss's book, Siddharth, the last line, if I'm not wrong, the knowledge is transferable, the wisdom is not. And translating knowledge into action requires wisdom. And wisdom lies there in the community and not necessarily only with the medical professionals. And with the medical professionals, the wisdom is again limited by their own limitations and the context. So I would say that it does require the local wisdom to be incorporated and their engagement with different community groups and sectors would be the key. And it's not just a biomedical lens through which you can solve these issues. So public health learning environment should be based on the philosophy that everyone teaches, everyone learns. Okay. Uh, Ms. Todd, uh, Dr. Todd. Uh, there is concern, even as we are fighting one pandemic which is on its way out and dreading pandemics that may still be around the corner, that we are getting heavily preoccupied in our mindset, both at the policymaker level and at the public level, with the idea of fighting pandemics and preparing our health systems and public health systems in particular to be much more ready to recognize and respond to those challenges. In that process, are we neglecting the routine functions that an efficient public health system is supposed to perform? And are we diverting both financial and human resources into pandemic preparedness and response at the cost? Or do we need to increase our resources, both human and financial, so that we can address both the challenges efficiently at the same time? Thank you so much. Um, so the 
first thing to say on that is during the COVID-19 crisis, there was absolutely a huge switch of resources to COVID-19. And my colleague, uh, D Africa director, who was in Kigali this week um, at the Africa Health Conference there, reported to me that that was a strong theme of uh, the week, that a lot of governments found that um, their usual business was defunded quickly because of COVID at the outset, leading to even a, a rise in maternal deaths in particular, section reproductive health services that I mentioned in the last panel particularly affected. Um, so, but that was during the COVID crisis period. I would not say that the evidence is present right now that spending on pandemic prevention and preparedness is displacing um, uh, health budgets. There's probably there small examples of that, but honestly, we're finding it hard to make the case for spending on pandemic prevention and preparedness. And crucially, one thing that we push for is always for that to be outside the health budget or as much as possible outside the health budget because this is something that affects the whole of society and the whole of the population. So it's a little bit more nuanced than that. We certainly saw it during COVID, um, but now we have to make the case both to invest more in health systems and protect legacies and get back to at least where we were and beyond, but also to not just drop uh, what we know we need to do like a stone on uh, pandemic prevention and preparedness. And then there's the, the other conversation around um, official development assistance, which has also tanked uh, from uh, many high income countries, especially uh, European countries with the onset of the Ukraine uh, war, um, uh, as well as COVID and Brexit was mentioned earlier, which has, has sort of changed the game in terms of where Britain is on the international stage, um, as, as we know. Um, so I think there are many things going on there, and uh, we need a, a complete reboot, really, of, of that sort of framing of how resources are transferred. And one thing that we really are trying to do at Pandemic Action Network is to reshape how we think of these international threats. Um, like. We, I'm not saying it's perfect with climate, but there is more of an understanding on climate change that unless everybody plays their parts, then you know, we can spend, we can invest, we can cut emissions, and frankly, if another country is not doing the same, then you know, we have to all march forward together. We haven't quite got there yet on the pandemic prevention and preparedness, even though it's an, another obvious international threat. So we really need to recast this relationship we have with these international threats. It's not about what can I do in my country because climate change uh, pandemics don't respect borders as we know. So what goes on in India, what goes on in Rwanda, what goes on uh, in the UK, in Belgium is as important as everywhere else. So until and unless particularly high income countries get the memo on that and understand that investing um, smartly across the world is important in partnership. Uh, it's not a charity frame, it's about self-interest. Then um, we, we're not quite going to get there. So we, we definitely need more resources, but we need this, this uh, systemic change as well. And there are really interesting uh, models such as the global public investment um, model, which is about everybody inputting to a, to a challenge, everybody benefiting, but crucially, everybody deciding on the rules of the road. And I think another um, one of the big trends that, that, that hopefully will sustain coming out of the pandemic, we saw uh, it, it was essentially a, a failure, I think, of, of uh, you know, global north-led institutions and thinking um, in the last panel, it was mentioned about uh, the, the need for more uh, intellectual leadership from the global south. I think the, the, there, is a, there is a complete vacuum of intellectual leadership on these matters in the global north, uh, but, a, but a kind of a, 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 le a resting on the laurels of, of uh, things that, that we've always done. And so there's a huge vacuum for political leadership, the kind of leadership, frankly, that 
um, the Indian government and the South African government showed at the WTO. We kind of need that now in this post uh, coming out of COVID, it becoming endemic atmosphere in order to inject the reality into, look, we need resources, we need them everywhere, and we need some big thinking solutions to get them flowing. So it's not just this charity frame, who can give what. Um, we also have uh, new entities like the Pandemic Fund that was launched last September. Uh, it needs $10.5 billion a year in order to fill country-level gaps in uh, specific pandemic preparedness and prevention um, and response readiness areas. Now, 10.5 billion shouldn't be too much to ask, really, uh, in the big scheme of things for a global entity, but it's only raised 1.6 billion um, so far. So that's something that we'd really like um, the Indian presidency of the G20 to, to help uh, push and get, get countries to capitalize. And why is that important to this finance piece? Because if we have a robust international system that can fill gaps for some of the LMIC countries, then they can then protect their health system financing and we, we can do the job in helping to protect that. So all of these things are linked, the global, the national, uh, and the, uh, the interface between them is so very important. So we definitely saw this huge shift during COVID. We need more investment in all these areas in this post uh, or coming out of COVID and COVID becoming endemic period. And uh, we also can think more about how to unlock tens, if not hundreds of billions through some of the multilateral development bank reforms. Um, another thing that we're working on at Pandemic Action Network, we need to change the game completely on this for primary health care, for health system strengthening, and for pandemic uh, prevention, preparedness, and response. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Habib, whenever we talk about uh, pandemic preparedness and response, enhancing the efficiency of our surveillance systems becomes a very important element of discussion of uh, both speedy recognition of threats and a fairly swift response as well for containment. Now we have a number of digital and molecular technologies that are coming in in a big way, including wastewater surveillance and a number of other areas. And we have seen how <coughs> genomic testing has played a very important role even in tracking and responding to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you think surveillance systems are going to be transformed in the future. Surely the epidemiology is going to be still important, but how will the software transform surveillance? Thank you, Dr. Reddy, <clears throat> and good afternoon, all. <clears throat> I think this is a really, really important question that uh, we are witnessing now with the emergence of sophisticated technology tools, not only just tools regarding with reference to the genomic sequencing, gene editing, CRISPRs, and also the technologies related to information technology, so higher computing and processing powers. But if I can take a step back and reflect back to what Dr. Reddy said in the start of the discussion of this session, we have to go back to understand what is the soul or the foundational purpose of the surveillance. What we wanted to do in the surveillance is to identify signals and the loads of the noises and these signals from the perspective of pandemic are the signals for the emergence of say new pathogens or emergence of the existing endemic pathogens in the new places. So from that perspective uh, if we talk as Dr. Reddy said about shoe leather epidemiology I think traditionally we have been focusing on active surveillance, passive surveillance, sentinel surveillance and uh, and we would understand that for these kind of surveillances, we need to set up systems in existing places of care. For example, you need samples or you track patients in the OPDs, in emergencies, in IPDs, and you focus on specific, say, syndromes or specific uh, illnesses. Uh, but with the emergence of new technologies, I think the, we can actually redefine the whole domain of the surveillance by understanding or by actually reflecting on what dimensions do we want to uh, now focus on. So we may want more complete information and 
the information can be completed through multiple ways. It's not just we track patients, but we can also track pathogen, as Dr. Reddy said. You can track pathogen directly in the wastewater and other places. And with emergence of uh, One Health, and we understand that many of those newly emerging pathogens spill over from animal health, it's really, really important to keep track or do surveillance in the animal health also. And with emerging AMR, we understand that existing pathogens are now becoming resistant to existing antibiotics, so we need to track them also. So all what is needed from the perspective of now surveillance is to understand that we have different systems that work together, come together, share data, and we need to set up such kind of surveillances which are not only timely uh, and also complete, but also responsive from the perspective of uh, creating resilient health system. So use of technology uh, from that perspective is really, really uh, an important dimension. But understanding that what surveillance systems are doing with regards to uh, tracking patients or tracking pathogens is we are collecting data from individuals. So at the same time, what we need is also establishing a balance between protection of privacy and confidentiality and at the same time have systems to share the data across, across say, disciplines, across systems or across countries. So to my understanding, if we reflect on the approaches for setting up a more <coughs> comprehensive or more holistic surveillance system, which help us detect uh, emerging pathogens or existing pathogens at the point of uh, emergence, we need not only just data sharing, but also policies and legal framework to allow us to share data. But at the same time, if, you, if I take example of COVID, we understand that Unknown pneumonia was reported from the Wuhan province in late December. Then in January, it was recognized as SARS. Then early, uh, I mean, in the next few weeks, within the January, the entire genomic sequence was available. And that availability of the genomic information helped actually transform the entire landscape of therapeutics, diagnostics, and uh, preventive measures such as vaccines. So in early February, we know that several countries came up with diagnostics. By May, I think several countries have heavily invested billions and billions of dollars in developing new technologies uh, with regards to development of the vaccines. So if we see from that perspective, we can clearly understand that surveillance as a tool is really a very critical tool which actually opens up pathways for research innovation. But what we really need to understand, as a colleague was saying, uh, with regards to the gap, north and south gap, in terms of access to technologies, when we share data which helps develop technologies, there has to be at the same time equally sharing of the benefits or so to say sharing of say uh, uh, the technology. So that there is a balance in terms of responding to the emerging threats. So to my understanding, uh, there could be several dimensions which we can think of from the foundation stone of surveillance itself what we want to focus on. We can think of surveillance from the perspective of, if I may just give you examples, we can do passion, uh, we can do individual tracking through their samples, so we can do surveillance of the laboratories, we can do surveillance within the uh, hospital systems. But at the same time, we also understand that in LMIC countries, there is a huge private sector which is really, really has deep penetration and is, uh, is, uh, is highly sophisticated and hugely powerful. So, do we have systems in place to have this sharing of data or sharing of information between the public and the private sector? And what are those frameworks that we can now use to actually have open sharing of this kind of data? And then legal implications and also research implications of that sharing of the data. Because, for example, uh, industry develops technology, but they also want to have patent on those technologies so that actually they can I mean, from their perspective, they can actually uh, uh, recoup the investment that they have made in development of technologies. So starting from surveillance, the data that we generate, the information that we generate, which is crucial for global pandemic response to be shared across countries, across sectors, but at the same time, it is equally important that the benefits that emerge from those uh, data sharing should be equally shared across the countries, across the sectors. So to my understanding, it is a huge, huge area where there is a huge scope for various stakeholders to come together and identify 
the areas where they need to focus on uh, in terms of development of policy and legal framework, in terms of research and innovation, and so on and so forth. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a very brief follow-up question. Given the fact that we have been talking a lot about community engagement, would a greater spread of digital literacy enable us to use crowdsourcing as an important contribution to early surveillance and detection? I mean, in effective surveillance and early reporting of outbreaks, or even unexpected uh, increase in farm animal deaths. So when we're talking about One Health, uh, do you think uh, we can actually use digital technologies much more uh, to enable people themselves to contribute to the surveillance? Oh, absolutely, Dr. Reddy. That, I mean, I think in India we saw a huge, actually, uh, a crowd movement, actually, in terms of not only just reporting uh, uh, the outbreaks at the local levels, but also there was a huge modeling. I mean, there was a huge community, a group of experts that come together medical doctors, epidemiologists, mathematical modelers, computer programmers who actually put together a dashboard and a system which was actually using the public and private sector data to actually build upon these models to predict uh, what they expect to see in future in terms of trends of the disease. And at the same time, uh, I mean, using these digital technologies, uh, there were experts who were actually continuously, I uh, would say, real-time tracking uh, the search on the social media about a specific kind of symptoms or the keywords, which was actually indicative of a specific transmission in a specific geographical zone. In fact, uh, you can also do tracking of, say, sales of pharmaceuticals or sales of specific medicines just to see what is happening in a specific zone. And with, I mean, countries like India and other where there is a huge digital literacy and deep penetration of technology, these technology are really, really and immensely beneficial. But as I said, I mean, the technology has, it's a double-edged sword actually, I mean, and many a times it really, the same technologies and the same social media platforms are usually used for wrong purposes. So the role of the decision makers and policy makers actually becomes more important with regards to use of the digital technologies, especially in sensitive situations like uh, pandemic uh, and uh, say vaccine hesitancies and other stuff. And now we are seeing emergence of chat GPT in academia also. So I think uh, we are into interesting times. Thank you. Uh, Vijay, Joshua Lederberg, who probably is the youngest or one of the youngest Nobel Prize winners in medicine and physiology for his work on microbial genetics cautioned us not to keep on talking about eradicating all microbes. He said because of their propensity to have fairly rapid genetic mutations it is our wits against their genes. Given that situation, with microbial mutations becoming inevitable, should we be focusing a lot more on how we can actually prevent the spread of infection and giving opportunities for microbes to mutate more rapidly? And should the whole area of infection prevention control become an essential part of training for all health professionals when I talk about the health professionals, I'm not only talking about doctors, but anybody involved in the health sector. And how do we extend this knowledge beyond the confines of public health institutions to everybody who is engaged with health? Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reddy. It's a great honor and privilege to be part of this um, gathering. And thank you, Dr. Reddy, for inviting me. So uh, talking about professions, I'm reminded about uh, George Bernard Shaw's, uh, you know, the doctor's dilemma is that every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. So <laughs> I think that we need to think more about how we engage with the community at large you know, in a participatory action strategy to combat the problems of today. So. Essentially, when you think about any kind of pathogen, it's basically a bunch of chemicals put together. It's information, whether it's a virus or a bacterium or a fungus or even our own 
innate uh, immune system attacking us. It's simply a bunch of code that is malevolent. So how do you address a malevolent code knowing that all of these things exist in nature? It's not simply uh, surveilling for pathogens of interest, whether they are drug resistant or not. There are resistomes out there that can be acquired and cause trouble. So in terms of infection prevention and control, I will tell you that in 40 years I have not managed to do it, so I'm a dismal failure. So <laughs> I don't know that. I have some great wisdom to impart on that subject. But I, I do think that one of the reasons why I failed and for many years struggled with it because I was trained in a biomedical construct. And trying to approach health as a purely biomedical construct is not something that has worked out well. Whether it's at an individual level or a family level or a community level, it really requires us to think very carefully about what kinds of outcomes we want. And for us, I think that we should be thinking about an outcome that allows people to have a purposeful life with autonomy and dignity. And that applies to the individual, to the family, to the community, to society at large. Which means that we must be willing to learn, we must understand complexity as you mentioned, because this is all, all of these things are part and parcel of a complex adaptive system. You fiddle with one thing one place and something else emerges. And we don't necessarily have the ability to predict exactly what will emerge and how it will emerge. All we can say is that something will emerge. I think we should focus a little bit on some success stories. Even when we have thought that we were losing the battle against drug-resistant organisms, there have been successes. What comes to mind is the example of Dharavi, one of the worst slums that you can think of, where passages are so narrow that even in full daylight, you need a flashlight to navigate your way through. The population there is so dense that people actually hire spaces to sleep for eight hours at a stretch. Once your eight hours are up, somebody else has to come. And think of the perfect milieu for a transmissible disease like tuberculosis to occur. And think about the perfect storm that this is the community and the physical environment that has the least capability of dealing with this kind of a problem. Yet, uh, we, in collaboration with the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, focused on not only new technology, a new drug, bedaculin, but also focused on counselors, skilled counselors who could follow these people, motivate them to take their medication, but yet at the same time ensure that their other non-medical needs were also met. So when the COVID pandemic hit and they could not even access adequate amounts of food, so the entire system mobilized to get food to these vulnerable people. So I think that if we are thinking about addressing infectious diseases, whether they are drug susceptible or drug resistant, we will do a much better job if we address the entire system as a complex adaptive system in a one health, one planet approach. Uh, thank you. There is a lovely book, a 2017 publication by two Princeton scientists. And the title of the book is, The Virus is a Complex Adaptive System. And if we didn't know it, SARS-CoV-2 virus has taught us that. But entirely true. Uh, what you're telling us is that even in order to respond to that, we need to stretch our resources from pixels to people. Right. Okay. Now, is the um, panelist from uh, Gates Foundation connected? Yes. Connected. Uh, you have heard the discussion so far. Uh, welcome to the panel, uh, formally. And uh, you have also seen how the panelists have described 
the requirements of a reinforced public health system in order to meet shocks which are going to be anticipated for the future at the same time also address the very many tasks that public health has to really address at this point in time including pandemics in slow motion like non-communicable diseases climate change overweight and obesity all of these are happening now so what is your view on how public health can be strengthened using the best of science to serve society okay you hear me okay we can now hear you yes yeah can you hear me okay i, I can hardly uh, hear you Okay, so Dr. Reddy and everyone um, in the panel, what an honor for me to join this. And I really motivate to learn. Um, I think uh, the COVID uh, give us a lot lesson to, um, and to learn, but I, I don't want to, I want to be humble. At the same time, I feel like as the professionals, like sitting here in this room, we know how to pro, uh, improve the preparedness. We already know. And, you know, I, but as other panelists already defined the problem for us, the, the problem is we don't, we only have short term memories and we don't, we don't give the resources that's needed to getting the work done for preparedness. Uh, I think in one of the, so we, we know, so I think how to change this, where the leadership, where the leadership going to come from? Uh, the other panelists talk about uh, wisdom. So how we can change this narratives about preparedness. I think as the uh, people already, you know, some uh, other panelists already mentioned, as the health professionals, we all have failed. And we are in the past. And in this year, 2023, we are in the risk again to losing uh, or fail again and people not listen to the risk of infectious diseases or pandemics. So how, I mean, how we define shocks is one area I will try, I will share with the panelists. And in one of the books that Bill Gates wrote um, in how to prevent the next pandemic, he put a sentence there uh, saying that if your neighbor's house is on fire, you know your house is at risk. Uh, if we think about firefighters, that's an interesting concept. You know, people know the risk and they can almost see or wish, you know, not need, um, doesn't need to kind of imagine much to getting uh, the sense about the danger from fire. And I know, uh, countries, especially developed countries, have for years uh, putting a lot of resources for firefighters. In China, uh, the first professional firefighter teams were established in 11th century, which is uh, over a thousand years ago. And in the United States, uh, the last statistics I saw was like they have uh, 311,000 full-time firefighters. And they also, um, they are, you know, putting into the neighborhood. They are respected as a heroes. But our public health professionals in China, for, you know, I can give you an example. In China, we have over 3,000 CDCs. That's a problem at the national, provincial level, and the county level, and city level. The exact number is 3,376 centers for disease controls. So CDCs in general, and prevention, so that's in China. They employ, last statistic I saw is that the number of CDC um, employees, the number was um, 200, uh, 209,550. So you see, we even in the huge country in China with 1.4 billion people, the number of public health professionals dedicated full-time 
to disease prevention and control, not only infectious disease, but all kinds of in, in, in chronic disease and everything, we have less number in this country than the number of firefighters in the U.S. So how are we getting the resources and to train the public health professionals that has good quality and a good competency? And other panelists mentioned that. They're well trained and they are they can put into good use. So I think that regardless of the you know pharmaceutical interventions or no pharmaceutical interventions, I think the question I've come to learn with many of the meeting uh, come to this meeting, I wish to learn is how we define our problem. I think we know how to prepare the pandemics. It's just how to define our problem so other people understand. I use the firefighters uh, analogy here. I hope that it can be one way to uh, to give us some, uh, you know, getting, you know, doesn't matter. You need to develop, you're getting the vaccine to people, you're getting the test to people. You need the right people with the right skills. And you have to engage the community and you have to be respected as the professionals. When I work at the US CDC many years ago, I worked there many years. <laughs> And uh, some of the respect we got was, uh, you know, different professions get different uh, respect. As a medical doctor, I think uh, uh, when I work at CDC, I got uh, respected, uh, you know, a little bit better than my other colleagues. So I remember at one point, um, one of my colleagues was pointed by other people saying that that's doc is a, that person was a wet. So he said, that's the cat doctor, you know. <laughs> and at China CDC at the time, um, when SARS broke out in 20, uh, late 2019 and early 2020, you know, the CDC director was a vet as well. So a lot of you know, people don't understand we need multidisciplinary uh, teams to respond to outbreaks. We do need people who understand uh, animal health. We do also need people to understand human behaviors. And obviously, between the uh, you know the uh, animal health, human health, and uh, economies and all that, we need to understand information how information transmitted in the population. So anyway, Dr. Reddy, I'm here to learn. I want to. This is a learning uh, co collaboration, and I just stopped here, and I wanted to give back the floor to you. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, we are all here to learn and we have learned a lot from you, so thank you. So now let me open it up to the audience for questions, Dr. Hazeltine. Uh, thank you, this has been an uh, extremely interesting panel. And I want to thank the, you, especially Dr. Reddy, for your very uh, succinct summaries of some of these discussions. Um, I thought I would rather than ask a question, share some experiences relevant to many of the comments that were made. And that is how the Boston, actually Massachusetts um, community responded uh, to the COVID pandemic. And it touches on almost everything people talked about uh, today. One of the most remarkable things that happened, and I say that as a professor at Harvard, where it is as likely that your neighbor was your enemy as your friend, uh, that we saw a dramatic change. And from the very beginning, beginning in March, thanks to a, uh, a grant from a Chinese company, uh, Evergood, uh, we formed something called the Mass CPR. And it was led by some of my former students, the dean of the medical school. And uh, we met three times a week, a total group of about 800 people from the Massachusetts, not the Harvard community, not the MIT community, not even the Boston community. And it was divided into pathogenesis, treatment, and epidemiology. And on the phone, virtually, uh, three times a week, at a regular hour, there'd be about a hundred participants in each of these sessions. And they would share 
their knowledge, not in preprint form, but pre preprint form. It was knowledge sharing was the first thing. What everybody heard, and we brought in many people from other countries, from South Africa, beginning in China, and other places. It's almost a case study of what you were talking about, how you deal with these problems. But there was a lot more than that. There were formal frameworks for how you share patient information, how you share patient samples, how you handle the intellectual uh, contributions. We had participants who were, Moderna was a participant, Pfizer was a participant, sometimes even the British government scientists were participants. Uh, it was, uh, it was, and I have to say it continues to be an amazing example. The public health services in Massachusetts were partners as well. So it was an entire intellectual community response to a problem. Um, I'm writing a textbook, or actually editing a textbook on COVID, and that's an important chapter in it. The people who actually put that together is a very important chapter about how you can respond to these things. The reason I mention it is that that is at least one thing that can be done in advance. You can begin to take these lessons about how to take a complete response, a community response. We were getting sewage data, for example. We we're getting variant data from South Africa, from India. Uh, we we're getting all sorts of information about how to, uh, we were getting the vaccine data before other people would get the vaccine data to know what we could begin to, to do with that data. And I don't think I've, I, I didn't certainly expect that to happen. Uh, but it is a great human response to a serious issue. I don't know if that was true of other communities, that we had that degree of cohesion and formality of, uh, of exchange. And I think that's something we can do in advance. We can begin to think of what areas that we need, what kind of agreements we need. I think you mentioned that. Uh, uh, what kind of agreements uh, that are needed to be a priori. Well, we have some examples of that now, especially, you know, sam the sample sharing, of course, was extremely important. So it's not information, that, and, and I have to say for treatment, it was the same thing. We're getting real-time data from all the people who are treating patients, exactly. There's proning work. Some, remember the enthusiasm for proning? It's kind of dissipated, but those are the kind of things that are were, were really important. Um, and, and I think that that's the kind of thing that we can do in advance. So I thought I would share that. Thank you very much. Uh, we at the Public Health Foundation of India did uh, three different webinars with the Harvard Medical School through ma uh, with um, Mass CPR. In fact, I must uh, mention that when first Salman Keshavji mentioned Mass CPR to me on a call to get us into that partnership, as a cardiologist, I thought CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. <laughs> and then I got educated. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Comments? I'm sure with all this uh, stimuli. Dr. Malarao, please. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, a really super panel. But I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't help but be tempted by what uh, um, Dr. Hesseltal has just said to just remind ourselves, because we all know this, uh, 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 and you were talking about cardiologists, but the way that cardiologists, uh, critical care c consultants came together, uh, you know, within days of the 11th of March to set up that world uh, kind of network of people who were exchanging information on what treatments work and the speed with which ethical committee approval for things like the recovery trial which you know you'll all have been part of um, took off and they started to say well you know this this treatment should this potent you know, this uh, hypothesized treatment better reject it because that doesn't work and this doesn't work and the speed with which they, um, they, you know, began to hone down on those that were really the best 
and the most effective uh, uh, sort of menus of treatment uh, for critically ill patients is another, I, th I think, an, an extremely inspirational example of how um, healthcare staff rose to that extraordinary challenge we found ourselves in, in 2020. So just a celebration of what uh, professionals end up doing, where in, uh, certainly in Britain, because you know we all um, criticize the health managers, and they sat there scratching their heads wondering what to do when the pandemic broke, but uh, the professionals quietly um, took charge and the way they responded was literally inspirational, heroic even. Thank you. Uh, indeed, during the pandemic, we saw science at its very best. But we also saw the growth of anti-science movements, fueled by uh, fake news. Now, how much of public health training should be imparted to enable public health professionals to counter this effectively and engage much more closely with communities so that they do not become vulnerable to this kind of anti-science emotions and fake news. Any panelists would like to respond? Alois, I think you should take um, Thank you. I just wanted to make another point on that, which is in some countries, a large percentage of healthcare workers had skepticism towards um, certainly the vaccine. So. There's an, there's an even bigger job to do to make sure that, that healthcare workers in times of crisis are educated, have all the information, and, you know, healthcare workers are obviously not generic. They are from their different communities, um, all the things that we talked about in the last panel. So the same uh, effort to communicate with people um, needs to be, be had. But... The short answer to the question is it's absolutely vital that those, um, we know that in so many countries across the world, uh, trust in healthcare workers uh, is super high. And certainly in the UK, um, where I'm originally from, I think healthcare workers, doctors and nurses are, are constantly the top scored, um, you know, who do you trust in authority? Uh, certainly not politicians. Um, but definitely doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers, um, and, and community workers, etc. So um, it's it's absolutely vital as a as as that kind of entry point for people in the the healthcare system um, as well. So I just wanted to make that point. So if I may add to that, one of the problems that we find is simply giving people more information actually makes them more adherent to their pre-existing beliefs. So I don't think it is simply a matter of teaching people how to articulate science properly. I think it is teaching people how to gain the trust of people that, you know, I really truly believe in helping you and I have got your best interests at heart. And this is, I think, one of the casualties of the COVID pandemic was that we had a paucity of honest people honestly saying, I don't know. I mean, how hard is that to say that I don't know, but I am going to find out, and I am going to honestly tell you the moment I find out. That's a practice that I have with my patients. I tell them, I don't know the diagnosis. I do know that you're ill, and I'm worried about it, but I care for you, and I will spare no effort to find out what I can do to help you. So not only credentials, but credibility and honesty. Now, that brings us back to primary care. Given the fact that we have people who are both frontline health workers as well as primary care physicians who are expected in a well-functioning health system to be in close and continuous contact with the public, if the primary health care system is really functioning very efficiently, then one would think that the community would draw comfort from whatever they're being told by these trusted messengers. On the other hand, if it's only a top-down approach, that may not register and that can easily be countered by fake news. Uh, Professor Murthy. This is wonderful listening to the impact of fake news. But there is another dimension. Most of the health workforce at the primary level come from the local communities. And they have their own set of beliefs. 
I remember when I was working at the Rural Health Center of Ames, the A&M would go and give an excellent talk on why colostrum should be fed, and she would end saying, I will not give it to my child. That would be the last line of that talk. So I think there is a need to look at the cultural context in the education of the frontline health workers. Absolutely. True. Very true. Very true. Comments or questions? Uh, we have up to 4.45, is it? Yes, yeah. you do. So I think uh, we ought to be able to take a few more questions or comments yes. or challenges. Uh, Professor Shalini Bharat, please. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I missed uh, quite a bit part of, uh, you know, the panel discussion because of some urgency. But I remember, you know, what in the uh, beginning part uh, was said that uh, uh, so much, you know, human resource and financing was diverted to COVID pandemic and, you know, other diseases and so on were left unattended and, and, and what was the cost of it. Uh, so... Uh, we heard this kind of an argument even in the you know hiv epidemic time that there was a lot of uh, i would even say anger you know that so much is being spent on this and what about other diseases so my question is that uh, can we afford to look the other way when there are pandemics and with very clear uh, you know consequences uh, one of course answer would be that you know create a, you know a non health kind of a fund because you can't take from the regular health sector funding, but you should create some more. Um, but other than that, um, as public health specialists, do you think you know, we can ignore, because the consequences of not stemming something at that point in time could be really huge. And again, in HIV epidemic, we found not only that we were forced to do or we should have done or whatever we did, but uh, HIV uh, allowed us to, you know, expose the fault lines in our society. And so many things came out of it. Uh, so I just, uh, you know, was wondering how do we answer that question. No, no, I entirely agree with you. I don't think any public health emergency can or should be ignored. I think the lesson is that we ought to create health systems which can do more than one thing at a time. If you have, if you are running only on one leg, you can't pick up speed, even in your pandemic response. Uh, I remember in some, one of the early stages of the HIV uh, pandemic, a public health expert from Thailand telling us that suddenly they're getting a lot of money, but they don't know how to absorb it and utilize it. The, the analogy, the metaphor he used was, we are trying to squeeze a watermelon through a, a garden hose pipe. Now, therefore, you do require a fairly strong health system, well resourced in the beginning, in order to be capable of absorbing and utilizing the additional resources to meet the public health emergency. I don't think we ought to be bickering among ourselves, saying that you are neglecting this, you are neglecting that. I think we should demand a fit-for-purpose health system. Any other questions? I think if I may add to that, I think uh, that what we do is, this is part of our own cognitive dissonance, that we create false dichotomies, right? So the HIV and the response to HIV at least helped us train an entire generation, if not two generations, in how to efficiently, effectively manage a major problem in health across an entire continent of India. And I think that we also took the, the same opportunity to learn how to deal with a lot of things that are not part of the biomedical construct. Before you came in, I was talking about how Tata Institute of Social Sciences helped us manage the entire TB conundrum in Dharavi, including the COVID impact on that TB management of drug-resistant TB. That's, that's, I think that this is, the, this is the argument that I would make to people who are bean counters and say, look, this is all the money you get, and you can't steal all the money for this. Something done well, effectively, is better than nothing done because of, quote, unquote, we cannot afford to do it. And I always say, you cannot afford to not do it. Thank you for that. I missed <laughs> hearing you. Dr. Hazeltine again. Uh, 
Uh, there's another sort of direct response to the question of uh, how you allocate resources in times of crisis. There are a few examples where people were prepared with uh, surge capacity. China in particular was prepared for surge capacity. Uh, there had been a program after their uh, shock with SARS and the economic fears that arose from that, uh, that they needed shock capacity, and you saw it in action. Uh, I don't know if you remember hospitals for thousands of people being built within two weeks, right? They did it. And now those weren't ideal hospitals, those were ideal places to be, but they had done that in advance. And that came about as a 10, 15 year involvement with the Harvard School of Public Health, where they studied in great detail what to do in terms of pandemics, and you saw it in action. Now, if it hadn't been for the virus doing what we just talked about, the virus doing, adapting, it may have worked, because the virus that they had at the beginning was very different from the virus they have now. It was at least 10 times less infectious, and it may have worked perfectly well. It didn't in the end, but that wasn't necessarily the, the, the fault of not preparing. The other lesson we had, and this goes even further back, what we saw China do, the United States had actually done in the 50s. Now, many people not, may not remember that, but we had created a system to create instant hospitals which were staffed in, re, in response to a nuclear attack. We had them all packed up, ready to go. Uh, and that is what you can do. Those are kinds of responses that can be made, and there can be systematic surge capacities that may not be used all the time, but we also use. There's other examples, and this is a more intricate example, but there are hospitals, for example, if you look at NYU in Langone in New York, they carried on both practices without a hitch. They had almost full surgical capacity, full emergency capacities for non-COVID and COVID at the same time. And why were they able to do that? Because they had planned in advance to do that. They had actually planned as a hospital. It's the only one in New York that didn't, if you look at all of their numbers, there was hardly a hitch. So it can be done with advanced planning, but it takes a great deal of advanced planning to do it. In fact, there is a fair amount of literature in safety science journals on how to deal with complexity and complex challenging situations. And one of the things they emphasize is that a complex system always calls for a certain slack. You need to have a little expense capacity readily available in order to do it. Of course, then create a surge response. But perhaps an extension to what you have said and derived from what you have said is not only in terms of equipment and in terms of actual uh, uh, hospital facilities or healthcare facilities, but also in terms of uh, the level of the community response in non-hospital settings. How can we actually also provide a greater amount of orientation and some skill building to community health volunteers who can actually step in? And that's happened in different parts of India. It happened in Kerala, for example, that a large number of community health volunteers were trained and they played a very active role, uh, both in surveillance as well as health education, building vaccine confidence. This happened elsewhere too. I think, again, when we look at expanding our health system capacity, we seldom take into account the community resources that are available and can be mobilized. A any other comments? Yeah, I tell you an anecdote about that. Yeah, sure. So in the last COVID pandemic, what happened is that one of my patients who came to me for several of his family members to be taken care of, I was explaining to him how I made choices, who got oxygen, who got dexamethasone, and what a simple thing it was to just check the oximetry and see what's going on. So he liked the simplicity. So what he did is he bought a whole bunch of oximeters and dexamethasone and spread it around to the entire group of villages where he had friends and relatives. And everybody was trained. If your oxygen saturation drops below 94%, this is the time for you to start taking dexamethasone and arrange for oxygen. 
and these are areas that had no access to diagnostic facilities or other healthcare facilities. And he literally got several thousand of his relatives and friends treated that way. And he is not a medical professional. So I, I think that if you have a community level engagement and you come up with easy to understand and simple solutions, you can deal with a fairly complex problem. Uh, may, may I may take the last question or comment from there. Thank you so much. I'd like to share our experience in Hawaii, a little island that fits in one marg of Delhi, the whole population. But this is what our problem was. We had the respirators, we had the hospital beds, we had the emergency services, we had the ambulances, we didn't have the medical personnel. We had a huge shortage of pulmonologists who, uh, the ones who were working, were heroic around the clock at the, at the time of the largest infection, uh, lung infections. Uh, nurses uh, were in total short supply. And so we saw it more as a manpower shortage than a, a lack of information or a lack of facilities. And I just wonder, I don't know how unique we are because we're 2,500 miles from the nearest land. So it's very hard for us to just import workers on the spur of the moment uh, from other states or other countries. We had some uh, Filipino workers who were very, very helpful come, but it was a matter of time to get them on island. Um, so I, I don't know how uh, unique our experience was, but we came away with saying we really need to increase the capacity of the specialists. We need to have on-call specialists in a far larger number than we would have had. And frankly, apparently, our health system uh, and the Public Health uh, Institute in our, in our state uh, really hadn't done that calculation. So uh, thank you again for the panel. It's been very useful. You know, you're absolutely right. Many parts of the world, including India, have experienced shortages during the pandemic. And even if you have reasonable numbers to begin with, in a prolonged pandemic, health workers get sick. When they're infected, they're isolated. When they're exposed, they're quarantined. Or if they're not sick and are working with a huge load, particularly when the cases are building up, they get exhausted and fall sick. So the need for having an expansile capacity in the health workforce is absolutely critical. And that's going to be one of the biggest challenges globally because many countries are seeing their younger populations shrinking. So their health workforce is going to shrink in Japan and elsewhere. And we have to make sure that not only countries like India meet their own health force workforce requirements, but can actually meet the global health workforce requirements, India, Africa, and other countries who are demographically younger. How do we actually develop that global health workforce without depleting national capacities? This is going to be one of the biggest challenges, even as we prepare for future pandemics. So yes, I agree. I will close this session now. Uh, with, I'm not going to attempt to sum up, but I think this has been a very rich session with many excellent contributions from the panelists. But I think the message is that we need people-partnered public health. We need to make the best use of science and to advance digitally enabled, decentralized decision-making at the district level if we have to meet public health emergencies competently. Thank you very much. It's always a privilege to listen to Dr. Reddy and actually him moderating a panel, uh, this is my first time. Usually I hear him speak and his debates are brilliant. May I ask Vinod to please come up while I sum up for one minute and see if I can make an effort to bring together some of those thoughts. Do we have an empty box that we can put into and take out something when we really need it? And that is when pandemic time comes. Can we actually run a race on one leg? We can't. If we need both legs, what is it that we need to do? Reinforce public health systems. Make sure that you have crowdsourcing and early advanced surveillance. Look at capacity building, capacity building, capacity building, and 
as much as you can. Look for complex health systems that call for slack when they actually need it. Because if you're already very, uh, you know, um, stretched, there is no way that you can add any extra capacity. So you need that slack. You need that 10% leeway. Waste water harvesting, and whoever thought of that as early service, surveillance? Technology, a double-edged sword, and does decision-making get supported by technology, or do we have vaccine hesitancy-like things that actually take away from there? Do we want to er eradicate those microbes? Those are questions that we need to ask. Prevent infection, look for prevention control. I love the conspiracy against the, ta uh, against the lady, and if that is a way to engage the community. Dr. Vijay L. Dandi, and this is something I always echo, life to live with autonomy and dignity. And can we make that the keystone and the cornerstone of making sure that each of us, not just does that for ourselves, but for those that are around us. Pixels to people? Are we there yet? Slow motion pandemics, obesity, climate change, amongst others. Those are not easy ones to deal with either, while we can see the rush of the pandemic and how we can actually bring things together to make health better. Learning from the past, that is something that we all are doing, even now, even as we are hitting the second year as a declaration of pandemic. And definitely we had more learnings from HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis that we are also trying to emulate as we come together. I cannot but emphasize that we need to do more than one thing at one time. Thank you all for such a lovely, stimulating conversation. Vinod, Vinod I'd like you to come up here. And Dr. Reddy, can you please come Dr. Reddy, can I ask you to come up?